All right, so if you have a Bible or a tablet or a phone, you can um, go to Joshua chapter 9. Last week we covered verses 1 through 16. Uh, 1 through 16, we learned about some kings that kind of rose up in the area of Canaan, and they heard about the exploits, the conquering that the Israelites had been doing um, for many years. Most recently, the, the last few years, they've been doing a lot of conquering, but they did, as they come into the land of Canaan, immediately, I'll just, I guess, pick up uh, where we talked about in Joshua chapter 2, where they crossed the Jordan River finally. They finally came into the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the desert. So we have a whole new generation uh, coming into the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb, who had been around since the exodus out of Egypt. So they made it through the wanderings, just those two, into the promised land with a whole new generation. They come across the Jordan. They take down Jericho. They, a little trivia question. How many times did they march around Jericho before the walls came tumbling down? Thirteen. So on the first six days, they went around once. So there's six. And then on the seventh day, they went around seven times. So six and seven is 13. So a little trivia question. Some people may say, well, it was seven days, but it was just seven days on the last of the seven days. So 13 times, the walls came tumbling down, so they felt really uh, courageous and they felt uh, high on their horse type thing. So their next city that they were supposed to come into the land and conquer next was AI. So they uh, looked out across the city, they kind of uh, scouted it out, and they thought they only needed about 3,000 men. To, to conquer it, so they sent the men up up the hill and they got routed. Basically, 36 men, I believe is the number, that ended up getting killed uh, as they retreated off the hill trying to take AI and failed. So then they found out about the sin of Achan in the camp, so that's the rest of um, chapter 2 and 3, I believe, talked about that. And then they ended up taking AI finally and Bethel, uh, the city next to it. So then we move forward into um, uh, chapter 9 where now they're getting ready to move further inland into Canaan. And again, the exploits of what the Israelites have been doing was made known or word of mouth had spread to the area. So now they're kind of meandering a little bit south from where Jericho and then Ai and Bethel, and now they're coming a little bit southwest into an area called Gibeon that we're gonna read about here in um, chapter nine still. But the Gibeonites had heard about the Israelites coming and they sent forth some ambassadors, um, some men, we're not told how many, to go talk to Joshua and the Israelites. And they went and talked to them in Gilgal, over there just west of the uh, Jordan River. And they made it sound like they were ambassadors from a faraway country. But they were not. They were from Gibeon, which was only about a 20-mile trek from Gibeon over to Gilgal. But they wore old clothes, and they had moldy bread and their sandals were old and worn out, and their clothes were old and torn and tattered. So it looked like they came from a long way, and they shared a story about how they had heard about the defeat of uh, the, the kings uh, Gog and the Sihon uh, across the Jordan River, which had happened uh, probably a couple years before this time. So it, their story sounded true, but it wasn't. We're going to find out what well, we found out a little bit at the end of the uh, mid-chapter last week, and we're going to really find out the truth uh, in the rest of the chapter tonight, how the Gibeonites were fibbing. Uh, we talked about last week how we thought they were being crafty uh, because they made up this really good-sounding story about how they came from a far country, but we found out that they did not. But at the very end of chapter 15, 14, 15, 16, I'm sorry, verses 14, 15, and 16 of chapter 9, uh, the Israelites and the elders, basically Joshua and the rulers of the Israelites, made a covenant with the Gibeonites. So once they made this sacred covenant with the Gibeonites, essentially they were under protection of the Israelites, and we're going to find out here that they soon realized that the Gibeonites were actually their neighbors now. They're right there where they're heading next. Um, and because of this covenant, normally the Israelites would come in and they were told by God to wipe out all the people of Canaan. But now they can't, and they won't, because of this covenant that they made with the Gibeonites. That's kind of where we left off last week, and now the rest of the story. So let's first read um, verses 17 through 27. Does anybody want to read, or shall I go ahead and read? 
All right, that might be good for a different taste. 17, 17 to 27. I like hearing the King James being read on occasion just because the, the, the word differentiation between the King James and the New King James is kind of neat. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the Old English, you know, they were sore afraid. Uh, just some of those phrases, they, they, they kind of make more sense, actually, than the more modern language. So that's, it's, I know you study in that version, and uh, I don't know, someday maybe I will too. <laughs> All right, so verse 16, we're going to backtrack and kind of read every verse that we just read, but look at each verse um, in the New King James, uh, but also just kind of reiterate or expound uh, what each verse is telling us, hopefully, uh, what the Lord at least told me about these verses. And it happened at the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors who dwelt near them. Then the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities on the third day, now their cities were Gibeon, Chephira, Beeroth, and Kirjath, Jearim. So now the truth really comes out. We're really going to find out the Israelites are going to spill, I'm sorry, the Gibeonites are going to spill their guts and let the Israelites know, yes, we are your neighbors. Um, and we're sorry about what we had to tell you before, but we were sore afraid that you were just going to come in and wipe us out. So they disguised themselves, essentially. They came up with this pretty good story. They were crafty about what they were doing. And so they pretty much saved their people group. And we're going to see here in a little bit how these people of the area of Gibeon and kirjath Jearim are going to be remembered for generations and generations and generations to come. And I'll cite a couple of verses that show that. So the Israelites find out that the Gibeonites were actually not telling the truth about where they came from. Uh, the area that they were ambassador, ambassadors of, the area they so-called said, was the area of Gibeon. And I just read the four cities here making up this area, Kirjath, Beeroth, and Jephirah. The cities mentioned called uh, kirjath Jearim becomes a significant place because it ends up being a place where the Ark of the Covenant is going to end up staying for several years. So you can, I just picked out a few verses, but if you ever wanted to just do a study with your smartphone or blueletterbible.com or Bible Gateway or whatever site you may use to do some of your research uh, on the Bible, go ahead and uh, dig into that, type in a, a words like Kirjath, and it'll uh, find many passages in Scripture, which is, might be quicker than going to your back of the Bible to, to find it. But for instance, uh, in 1 Samuel 7, we see, Then the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill. 
and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in Kirjath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So we see many years after the time that we're reading about here in Joshua, in 1 Samuel, uh, the ark is going to be uh, stored in Kirjath in this area of Gibeon that wasn't completely destroyed because of this covenant that Joshua and the rulers made with the Gibeonites. And another passage in Scripture, 2 Chronicles uh, 1, verse 4, But David had brought up the ark of God from kirjath Jearim to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. So there are the cities mentioned once again. And, and lastly, this is kind of going much further into the future. In Nehemiah chapter 7, uh, these are the people of the province who came back from the captivities. So this is after Nebuchadnezzar came into the land three times, three different times, and took people back to uh, Babylon. Now some people were finally granted by Cyrus, uh, the king of Persia or Medea? I think it was Persia. Granted them access to come back to Jerusalem and Ju Ju Judah. Uh, so we see that here. The men of Kirjath, Jearim, Shephira, and Beeroth 743 were those were the ones that just chose to come back to the area uh, we read about another passage in scripture that many men and women and children families decided just to stay there in babylon and did not come back to jerusalem and judah so just one city there uh, a lot of history to it and if they had first come into the land and wiped it out completely and burned it to the ground like they did jericho and uh, ai we may not have this history still available to us. So moving on to verse 18 in Joshua 9. But the children of Israel did not attack them. So this is after their three-day journey. They come into the land. The children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel, and all the congregation complained against the rulers. So here we go. We see the church way back then wasn't any different than it is now, right? We, we got the people of the congregation complaining against whoever the rulers might be. So I'm glad we don't have that here, right? But yeah, we, we still have that even at the bridge and many other churches, I dare to say every church has got some murmuring going on. Obviously, we want to keep that to a minimum. Um, so, but that happens. And it's amazing when you go through the, the book of Exodus uh, how... Moses was able to bring out the people out of Egypt, and then a couple days later, if not the next day, it seems like they're complaining to Moses about, why did you bring us out? We just saw this huge miracle of people walking through the Dead Sea on dry ground and the Egyptian army drowning in two inches of water or a full sea. However, you know, that myth that people say that it wasn't really a, a sea, um, say it was only two inches of water, and you know, Pastor David just explained that miracle that must have happened uh, a Sunday or two ago. So. I'll let you go listen to that if you want to hear that story once again. But the congregation is complaining against its rulers. Essentially, the congregation is murmuring, murmuring against Joshua uh, for this blunder. Uh, the congregation was probably murmuring. Why? Because they were told once they go in and take some of these cities that they were actually able to take the plunder uh, of the city. So is, actually, the Israelites were becoming very wealthy. You know, they had the exodus, and they took, or they actually asked for and were granted probably hundreds and hundreds of pounds of silver and gold and uh, stuff, because even when they were in the wilderness, remember when they made that uh, calf out of gold? You know, people were giving them all their earrings and their bracelets and stuff, and they melted it down, and um, Moses' brother Aaron uh, made this calf. Wow, it just popped out of the fire type thing. So they had a lot of the gold and stuff that they used up then, but now that as they're coming into the land, they have that treasure resource plus all these new cities that they're coming into and taking the spoils, essentially, for the, the treasury of the Israelites. Uh, so they were looking forward to going into this big city of Gibeon, which is actually what we'll see in other passages of Scripture, where Gibeon was actually one of the mighty cities of the area. So they were probably expecting a big plunder when they take down this big city. And now the rulers are saying, well, nope, we're not gonna, we can't take this city because of this uh, covenant, this sacred oath that we made. So here we see, I might consider, you might consider, you know, this is um, Joshua's kind of second big mistake. 
His first big mistake that we read about, which was again back in Joshua chapter 2, was when they tried to take AI that first time and failed. Uh, so what was the common denominator? What was the root cause? What was the reason for these two failures? Well, I would say that Joshua did not seek the Lord first in prayer. He didn't seek the Lord first in prayer in both situations. Uh, as you read through the book of Joshua, there's going in upcoming chapters, there's going to be time and time and time again, beginning in Joshua chapter 10, where Joshua does nothing but seek the Lord, seek the Lord, seek the Lord for every single decision. And some of the things that he hears from the Lord that we're going to read about and shared by some other uh, pastors and elders coming up is, is like weird. The Lord tells Joshua and the army to go around this forest and listen for the treetops. The treetops are going to talk to you, essentially, is what he says. And it's just kind of a rushing wind that's going to go through the treetops and make a noise. When he hears that noise, that's when you're supposed to go forward and conquer. So things like that is what Joshua is going to start to hear from the Lord when he starts listening and asking for the Lord to help out. So Joshua did not seek the Lord twice, and he had two significant failures. So my first life lesson is seek God first to prevent getting into ungodly alliances. So where... How, where else might we get ungodly alliances being formed? Well, the, the one here in Scripture that we're reading about right now is the, the alliance with the Gibeonites and the Israelites. But bring it to present day practical application, uh, we could easily get into ungodly alliances with our, uh, you know, back before we were married. Uh, if we chose to, you know, back when we were young, you know, when we're in lust with somebody, we thought that this was the person. This was the person that we had to marry. Um, so we were dating for a while or whatever, and you thought it was the one for you, right? Um, but you were possibly unequally yoked. Maybe you weren't a believer then. For instance, myself and Margaret, my wife, uh, been married 24 years, but when we got married, I was not a believer, and she was. We were unequally yoked. And that, according to Scripture, in the finest the strictest sense, I guess, was an ungodly alliance. We were unequally yoked. But in another passage in Peter, it says, you know, that she was a believer, that if she wanted to be engaged with an unbeliever, I guess the idea was that, well, I'm not going to, that's a whole, I'm going to travel down a path. If she stuck it out with me, she could end up leading me to the Lord, essentially. She did end up leading me to the Lord because of her witness. Um, so that's a whole different story we could talk about outside of here. Uh, that I can share with you. So that was an ungodly alliance that turned out well, I think. I mean, I became a believer, and, uh, and we're still married, and so uh, happily ever after. How about another ungodly alliance? Well, if you're a business person, maybe you uh, decide to go into a, a partnership. You probably heard that term with somebody else. And if you didn't do your due diligence and check out this person, their financial situation, their morals and their ethics, if you didn't know this person for a long time, before deciding to go into this partnership type agreement, you may find out that if you mistakenly don't do your due diligence, get into it, and then years later maybe find out that they don't have the same type of understanding about finances or how to run business or how to hire people or how to fire people or how to do whatever your business is, you could easily get into ungodly alliances there as well. Um, so this could go into many different facets of our life so we need to seek God first. And seek God first, and we may spare ourselves some tragic experiences in life. So seek God first, and we may spare ourselves some tragic experiences in life. Another thing I heard just recently, so I threw this in last night, was wait until you know. So sometimes you just need to pray, and guess what? God's not just going to text you or email you or call you up and say, here's your answer. Sometimes it's going to take a while, doesn't it? Um, I came into church tonight, and I saw someone pacing around the hallways, and I asked them if they were talking, and they said, yeah, I'm talking. Hopefully I'm not talking to myself, is, is kind of what they said, but I know they were, they were talking to the Lord. Uh, that person may or may not have heard yet an answer to what they were talking to the Lord about. Uh, chances are the Lord is going to answer that request with a yes, no, or not yet, or you're not ready yet, or whatever the situation is. But again, we're not going to get an immediate answer all the time. You may get it sometime, um, but not always. 
So the, the key thing is, is wait until you know. Then make that decision and move forward. Wait until you know you are sure. Joshua and the Israelites, they didn't wait until they knew for sure. I talked about it last week. They could have asked a lot more questions about the Gibeonites and where they came from, but they didn't. They used their sight and what they thought was their intellect to make their decision rather than seeking the Lord first. Verse 19 and 20. Then all the rulers said to all the congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore, we may not touch them. This we will do to them. So instead of killing them, wiping them out, we made this sacred covenant so we can't touch them. So what are we going to do? We're going to end up doing this. This we will do to them. We will let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore, uh, swore to them. So the rulers, and Joshua, he's, he's one of the rulers of the, the congregation of the Israelites, stand their ground and they explain to the rest of the congregation of the Israelites why they can attack these people, which we've just kind of discussed a little bit. They explain that this is a sacred oath sworn to the Gibeonites by the Lord God of Israel. Uh, so this is very important, this oath that they made. So we're going to look at a few passages of Scripture here that talk about how the Lord himself has actually sworn uh, by himself or his holiness or his great name in certain situations and how sacred making an oath really is. So because an oath was made, which was binding and sacred, the Israelites were not allowed to kill the people of the area of Gibeon. Oath-taking and swearing was, was a very solemn affair back in the days of Joshua. To take an oath was to give a sacred and an unbreakable word to follow through on what was promised. So let's look at a couple passages where the Lord himself invokes his name. In Genesis 22, Genesis 22, when you, when you hear that chapter in the Bible, it should just spring to mind, at least to me, about what happens in Joshua 22. I think every pastor that I've seen on stage here has at some point referenced Genesis chapter 22. Uh, you know, Abraham gets the call to do what? To take his one and only son, Isaac. Take him where? To Mount Moriah. Do what? Sacrifice him. What? Sacrifice your only begotten son? I mean, that was unheard of for an Israelite to do that. Only the, the, the people of Canaan were kind of sacrificing their kids, but he was called to do it. And what did he do the next day? He immediately woke up and went. Um, just that in itself was, a, I think, a whole teaching, Pastor David, just the obedience of Abraham to do that. Uh, and then he finally takes, I think, three days to get there. That, that number three comes up in Scripture a lot takes him three days, just like it did here, didn't it? Three days to go from Ai down to Gibeon. But three days for Abraham and Isaac and a couple servants to make their way to Mount Moriah. They get at the base of Mount Moriah, and what does Abraham say? He says, come on, Isaac. I got the wood. I got the knife. I got some matches here, a little uh, Bic lighter type thing. Let's go to the mount, top of this mountain. He says to the servants, stay behind. We're going to go yonder and worship. We'll be back, though. Say what? He's supposed to go there and sacrifice his son Isaac. He says, we're going to come back. So he already has faith in knowing that whatever happens, Isaac is going to make the trip back. That's pretty cool. That's a huge step of faith there as well. So Genesis chapter 2, there's just a, a, that's an awesome big chapter to, to study and look into. But these two passages of, or verses come from that chapter. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Then also in Psalm 89, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. Speaking of King David. And then lastly here in Jeremiah 44, Therefore hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God lives. So swearing falsely was a very grave sin, again, back in the day of Joshua. Ezekiel um, mentions this in verses 17 through 20. So this is Pharaoh, uh, an Egyptian ruler, not a believer, 
in Jesus, nor will Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company do anything in the war when they heap up a siege mound and build a wall to cut off many persons, since he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, uh, and in fact gave his hand and still did all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath, which he despised, talking about um, Pharaoh, the oath that was made between uh, Pharaoh and Moses, and my covenant which he broke, I will recompense on his own head. I spread my net over him, and he shall be taken in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon and try him there for the treason which he committed against me. Treason, that's a pretty strong term as well. We haven't heard that word in our common lingo or even in news feeds recently. Probably have to go way back into the 60s, 70s, or the Cold War era where we heard about um, spies for both sides of the country, um, Russia and the U.S. and all those different uh, warring countries. Uh, that's probably the last time I heard the term treason being used. Uh, well, um, who's the Snowden? Uh, I guess he was kind of in the lines of um, releasing all that information that they said he shouldn't have. And I don't know the whole details of that, but that, that was kind of treasonous maybe. At least some would state that it was. So that's maybe the last time I've heard of the um, term treason being used. So in present day, if this case were brought in front of a judge, so this case of the Gibeonites versus the Israelites, what's the case? Well, the, the Israelites would say, well, the, they gave us false information. There's the false pretenses that were being shared with us, so that's why we decided what we did. And if you were to bring that type of case to a present day court of law, it would probably be thrown out because of false pretenses. There was misinformation being portrayed. So whatever agreement was made after that fact of bad information being shared, I'm sure the judge would probably just throw that out of the court and it wouldn't go any further and it would be, whatever the decision made would be dissolved, I would think. I'm not a lawyer, but that's kind of what I'm thinking would happen. Uh, so, it, so this idea of having a covenant is something very sacred, again, especially back in the days of Joshua. That brings us to our next life lesson. Keeping your word at any cost will bless others, and you will be honored by God. So keep your word at any cost. And a, a verse that may come to mind when you think about keeping your word uh, you know, is referenced here in James chapter 5. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. So we see that sort of happening here, that the Gibeonites told a falsehood. They did not tell the truth. Uh, they are going to fall into judgment. They're actually going to be punished. They're going to become slaves um, of the Israelites from here on afterward. Hello, sir. We're in uh, Joshua chapter 9. Do you have a... Let's see here. Well, go ahead and take this one. We're in Joshua chapter... I'm in Genesis there. If you can flip through to Joshua, though, if you want to follow along. But I have all the verses up here. Is that too small for you to maybe read? Okay, I'll take it back, and the verses will be up here on the screen. <laughs> this is... I think it might be too small for him to read. Is that bigger? Yeah, yeah, could be. So let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. So let's take it a step further. Does this concept bring to mind maybe something else? To me, it kind of made me think about the Ten Commandments. Not all of them, but at least one of them. Uh, so one of the Ten Commandments kind of falls into this category. First, another trivia question might be, where do we find in Scripture two chapters of the Bible that list out the Ten Commandments? Yep, so Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. So those are the two whole chapters that list out all Ten, uh, ten Commandments. So if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 20, we see the ninth commandment stated as, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So this is essentially pretty much what the Gibeonites did with the Israelites. 
They certainly bared false witness. They told a lie. They told a fib. Um, whatever you want to call it, they were trying to deal shrewdly or um, craftily, I guess is what the word used in the earlier part of the chapter 9 said. Uh, but yet, they, when it all comes down to it, they bared false witness. They were lying to the Israelites. And now they're going to be judged because of it. And they're going to accept this judgment as well. They were all about just saving their skin. They didn't want to have their families and themselves wiped out, which they had seen everywhere else the Israelites had gone. So imagine how society would change if everyone lived by this one commandment. Wow. Think about that for just a second. You know, if everyone told nothing but the truth, so help me God. Imagine what your personal relationships would be like with your children, with your spouse, with your employer, uh, with people here at church, just everywhere, if no one had a reason to bear false witness. If, if everything that happened, you asked somebody how their day went, oh man, instead of getting the, what's the, not the carte blanche, but the, just the typical saying, well, it was fine, it was good, uh, but they really told you what happened. Uh, you'd probably have longer, deeper conversations because people would just be pouring their guts out, wouldn't you? Instead of just the quick passing in the hallway saying, fine, how you doing? Fine, all right, see you later. It would be more of the, oh, let me tell you about this. Let's sit down on the pew over here and let me lay my, uh, pour my guts out type thing. You'd have a lot more of that if people were telling the truth all the time. But then we wouldn't have as much heartache, though, either, would we? There wouldn't be the covering up of a falsehood or a lie for days or weeks or months or even years, decades, some family members have kept uh, falsehoods from other family members, and then it finally comes out, and man, the pain and anguish that is uh, had around that time. So it's very, it can be very traumatic and heartbreaking for people to finally find out the truth years later. We're going to see God honored his, this covenant that Joshua made. Uh, uh, Joshua made a covenant, as we're reading about, and it's going to uh, be illustrated uh, a little bit partially in this verse, 2 Samuel 21. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. So King David called out to the Gibeonites, uh, which were, he probably had to travel to get to where they were. He's in Jerusalem, they're in Gibeah, quite a distance away. So now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. So we, again, we're back in Joshua 9. We know they're not the children of Israel, but here in yellow I highlighted, the children of Israel had sworn protection to them. So this is referencing all the way back to where we're at right, right now, Joshua chapter 9. The children of Israel had sworn their protection. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you, and with what shall I make atonement? So he, he recognizes that an oath was made with the Gibeonites. Saul, the prior king before David, killed many of the Gibeonites, which they were under the protection of the Israelites, and Saul should not have done what he did. David hears about this, knows about this, and seeks atonement now for the fault of the prior king. Notice here it says, David, after three years, why did it take David so long? Well, I mean, if we had a, a I'm just speculating, if we had a, a drought start today, we wouldn't know it was a, a drought for a month without rain or two months without rain. But three years go by. This is a long time to think, well, shoot, I wonder if I should seek the Lord and maybe is there anything I can do if I ask the Lord what's going on? I don't know, but it, it mentions that for a reason. And also it's year after year. To me, that's saying it's three years in a row. It's not like three years out of seven. It's year one, year two, and year three of nothing but drought and famine so David seeks the Lord, he gets instruction, he seeks out the Gibeonites, he wants restitution, he wants to um, make atonement with them, and so he asks them the question. And I only quote these three verses, but you can see God is honoring the covenant that was made with the Gibeonites years after the fact because 
Saul committed his sin, but David is coming in behind Saul, kind of cleaning up the mess a little bit, and is going to make restitution uh, with the Gibeonites. He ends up handing over um, several different family members of Saul to the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites kill them, hang them on a hill, and that's the restitution that they were seeking for. Um, so it's an awesome story there. You, you think, maybe thinking to yourself, man, this, this, these stories are in the Bible. I can't believe this. But yeah, it's a real life stuff that happened. I encourage you to dig into it and read it if you haven't read it cover to cover. So we see, instead of killing them, they were relegated to becoming servants and slaves to the Israelites that we read here in verse 21. And the rulers said to them, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers or the King James, I think, said drawers of water. It's kind of a neat, uh, different way of um, illustrating it, meaning they actually had to probably go to the well, take the bucket, hook it up to the hook or whatever it was on the end of the rope, drop it down into the well, splash. Okay, now I can start ringing it back up. So they had to do that day after day after year after year after decade of being drawers of water and carrying the water from the well, wherever it was, back into the city, time and time and time, and cutting wood. Everyone knows here that if they didn't have a nice hydraulic wood cutting machine like we do nowadays, cutting wood is arduous, hard, blistering, back-breaking work. And this is, we're going to find out, they're okay with it. They're alive, and they're being protected. So instead of killing them, they were relegated to becoming servants and slaves to the Israelites. Life lesson, <laughs> be careful what you ask for. You might get it. <laughs> That's what came to mind to me. So I thought I'd... And you can probably think about this too. I mean, there may be times where you're just in a, in a hole and you keep digging. What's the best thing to do when you find yourself at the bottom of a hole? You know, stop digging first. <laughs> stop digging. But you start asking the Lord, you know, what can I do to get out of this situation? And you start making maybe hasty speculation, hasty prayer requests. Um, and you'll notice God probably doesn't answer those, uh, hopefully. Unless you make it happen under your own free will, you can make things happen in your life if you try hard enough. I've tried. Um, so if you ask for cer certain things in earnest, be sure, be careful that they're truly what you want them to be because if it's something that God can use, he'll, he may let it happen. And God could use this. He needed the Gibeonites to be around decades and centuries later, uh, like some of those verses I read in Nehemiah, for them to go to Babylon and come back and repopulate the land. If they were wiped out back in Joshua 9, they wouldn't be able to come back to the land hundreds of years later, right? So God was working out his plan. The Gibeonites said, don't kill us, but make us slaves. And God said, okay. And that's what happened. Joshua 22, or 9.22. And Joshua called for them, and he spoke to them, saying, Why have you deceived us, saying, We are very far from you when you dwell... We are very far from you when you dwell near us. So he's asking them this question again. Now therefore you are cursed, and none of you shall be freed from being slaves, woodcutters, and water carriers for the house of my God. So we had verse 22 and 23 uh, in there. Joshua confronts them once more. We saw in the first 16 verses of this chapter that Joshua and the Israelites already confronted the Israelites, the Gibeonites once, so now he does it again. Uh, Joshua calls them cursed now. Notice there in verse 23. And they will always be slaves for the house of God. This curse actually goes back to the days of Noah. Um, if you have your Bibles, and if you want to, you can go back to Genesis chapter 9. Um, but notice here in Genesis chapter 9, I don't have these verses um, up on the screen. I'll have a couple verses up later. But it says in verse 1, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So I just wanted to throw that out there first. So I, that's a little backdrop to Noah's three sons. Ham, um, Shem, I was, wanted to say Sam, but I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So those are the three sons of Noah. And what we're going to see here is that Noah 
after he starts to get settled in the land, you know, after they come off the ark, he becomes a farmer. So probably back in around verse 20 or so, um, I can't remember what verse it is, it says that Noah actually becomes a farmer. So then Noah plants a vineyard, and after time goes by, those vines grow up. He starts to harvest some of the grapes, and he says, whoa, let's, what can we do with these grapes? Uh, it turns out he can make some wine, and he drank some of this wine, and he gets drunk. So he gets drunk one night. Um, something happens, he ends up naked. Uh, long story, but you could probably relate to that in some form or fashion, maybe. Um, something happened, he ends up naked, and his son Ham sees his father's nakedness. Ham comes out of the tent, tells his brothers Shem and Japheth, whoa, dad in there tied one over last night, he's naked, we can't go in there, give him some time type thing. And, but Shem and Japheth, they kind of look at each other, and kind of hang their heads, and know what Ham did and saw was not right. You, you should not be seeing your parents' nakedness. I mean, that was kind of a, a bad thing to do back in the day. So what they did is they took a blanket between uh, Shem and Japheth, and they drooped this blanket over their arms and their shoulders, and they walked into the tent backwards, not looking back, averting their eyes so they would not see their father's nakedness. So when they drop, when they maybe saw their father's feet stick out from under the tent, the blanket that they were carrying, they drooped down the blanket on their father, Noah, and they just kind of walked out of the tent. Eventually, Noah wakes up. He recognizes, oh, I, I got this headache. What happened here? Uh, the sons, the two sons probably tell Noah their dad, Ham saw you naked. Uh, and then here we are in Genesis chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. So again, Noah had his, these three sons. Ham was blessed by God like his other two brothers we see in Genesis 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. So notice what happens here. It's not Ham that gets cursed. But Noah curses Canaan. Canaan is Ham's son. So kind of indirectly, Ham is cursed. But it's Canaan that is cursed here. We can see that here in this verse. Uh, Canaan is the ancestor of these people groups that we see in the land here called the, uh, the people groups, one of them being the Hivites. Uh, hence the name of this area. We've called it you know, the promised land or the land of Canaan. Canaan is Ham's son, and that's, it goes all the way back to Genesis 9, where this promised land, Canaan, that name comes from. Um, and this, these people groups were cursed because of what Ham did by seeing his father's nakedness. So this covenant was necessary for the Lord to fulfill his word that the sons of Canaan would become servants. So that's exactly what we're seeing here. It goes all the way back to Genesis 9, why these Gibeonites, Hivites, that were relatives of Canaan are now cursed. Like we see here in Genesis 9, we mention it here in Joshua 9, 23, you are cursed. So there's kind of the tie uh, between what we see in Joshua 9 going back to Genesis 9. <clears throat> so moving on to verse 24 of Joshua chapter 9. So they answered Joshua and said, Because your servants were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you, therefore we were very much afraid. We were sore afraid for our lives because of you and have done this thing. We told this falsehood. We bared false witness. We told you a lie about where we came from. We weren't truly ambassadors. All right, that's kind of what they were saying to Joshua. So the Gibeonites, they come clean and share that they knew the command that had been given to Moses by God to destroy all the inhabitants of the promised land. So besides conquering, or besides the conquering done by the Israelites at Jericho and Ai, uh, most likely the Gibeonites had heard of the exploits that happened during the course of the Exodus. How they had come out and then in more recent times how they had conquered the, the kings, the two Amorite kings across the Jordan River, Sihon and Og, that we read about uh, last week. 
So they had heard about that. They had heard about the Exodus. They had heard about the Red Sea crossing on dry ground. They saw probably or heard about at least the uh, crossing on dry ground of the Jordan River where they came across to conquer Jericho. So these stories have been emanating and permeating the land for 40 plus years. So the Gibeonites were saying, man, there's no way we can defeat these, these Israelites. They got their God on, the, on their side and he is invincible. Um, so that's kind of why they're telling um, Joshua why they did what they did. They knew that Moses was given the command to destroy all the people groups in the land. Verse 25 and 6. And now here we are in your hands. Do with us as it seems good and right to do to us. So he did to them and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel so that they did not kill them. So the Gibeonites do submit to the Israelites and accept their fate as slaves, as woodcutters and drawers of water. Joshua here is kind of sort of protecting the Gibeonites from the children uh, of Israel that wanted to kill them. It's kind of interesting that the uh, congregation, that so many of the children of Israel actually wanted to kill the Gibeonites. And remember, that's understandable because that's what they were told to do by God except that this covenant was made. And they had to know about the covenant. Even though they're a huge group of men and women coming into the land, well, actually, it's probably just the men at this point. Uh, remember, their base camp is back in Gilgal, and I'm thinking a lot of the ladies and the uh, children are back at Gilgal, and it's just the men making war on these um, cities. So it's still dozens of thousands of men um, coming into this land, and they all had to know about this covenant that was made by Joshua and the rulers, and yet they were almost willing to set that aside and still kill the Gibeonites. But the rulers were standing the ground, which was good. So that, that to me, um, just kind of goes to say or show that even in a, a healthy body of believers, there is a possibility of a, a sect, a, a, a small group of people, or individual even. And, and we classify those people maybe as a wolf. We've kind of heard of that happening, and a lot of the church splits that you may have heard about, I'm sure, at some point in time has happened because of a sect, a clique, a group, or an individual in a congregation has kind of fallen away or something that's caused them to disseminate false information, share falsehoods and lies, share stories that aren't true. We don't get that gist of it from the Israelites, but yet they were willing to put aside the oath. So something was going on there that they weren't wholeheartedly willing to stand up and abide by this sacred oath given to them that they made with the Lord's covenant, with the Lord's grace. So I just thought that was interesting that they were so willing to let this happen, but the rulers did not allow it to happen, which is what the rulers should do. Um, so apply that how you might in your life to know that wherever we might be, there's the likelihood and possibility that there's people around us and surrounding us that may not be exactly who we think they are. So that's where we need to be diligent, seeking the Lord, uh, asking questions to, 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 to know the people we think we know, we really know. Not that you have to go on a witch hunt every time you meet somebody new and try to see if there's any dirt you can dig up. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying be diligent and be careful and be wise as a serpent with the relationships you form. And finally, verse 27. And that day Joshua made them woodcutters and water carriers for the congregation for the altar of the Lord in the place which he would choose even to this day. So the Gibeonites become servants to all the Israelites and to the altar of the Lord. Note that the Gibeonites were uh, to serve in places which he would choose. Notice he here is capitalized. So the God, God, is going to choose where these individuals sh should serve. So they were inten intended to serve in not Canaanite ritual practices. They were supposed to be now serving God with the Israelites wherever God chose them. And we're going to see here that a couple places are mentioned where they end up serving and that are places of worship. 
So one of those places uh, includes Shiloh and Gibeon itself. So again, Gibeon was restored and saved to actually be a mighty city and a place of worship in the land of Canaan. All right? Joshua, so in the same book that we're in now, a few weeks from now, when we finally get to Joshua 18, we'll read, Now the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there, and the land was subdued before them. So as, we, as the Israelites migrate through conquering city after city, the Gibeonites are going to be with the Israelites, serving them, drawers of water, being woodcutters, and they're going to end up serving in places that he chooses, God, in these places of worship. One of them ends up being Shiloh. And in 1 Chronicles 16, And Zadok the priest and his brethren the priest before the tabernacle of the Lord at the high place that was at Gibeon. So here again, the city of Gibeon was restored. It was saved to be a high place for the children of Israel to worship, yet it is in the land of Canaan. So the words, even to this day, that we see at the end of verse 27 here, imply that Gibeonites indeed continue this servitude for a very long time. Um, I quoted a couple passages, you know, from 1 Samuel and 1 Chronicles and Kings. Those are all decades, if not centuries, into the future from this time. So, and they're being servants throughout this whole time. And then in, even in Nehemiah, they go to Babylon and they come back. They're, these are still the Gibeonites, essentially, coming back to their home cities of Kirjath, Jearim, Chirphira, and Beeroth. Um, again, those were all Gibeonites, hundreds of years coming back into the land. So, in summary, the whole chapter 9 of Joshua, we've learned about the crafty Gibeonites, how they were crafty and shrewd early on. They told a fib, they were shared falsehood, falsehoods for several different reasons that they shared, essentially to save their butts. They didn't want to be wiped out and killed, and God honored that yet they had to become slaves and serve the Israelites uh, in perpetuity. And God, know what? He allowed this to happen. It all worked according to his plan and his timing because that's the way it was planned to be from day one, and that's the way it worked out. So that's all I got. <laughs> so at the end, let's uh, close in prayer. Joshua 9. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for, again, this time of uh, study and reading through your word, and Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to just to learn more and to learn more about you, uh, and Lord, how we can use your word to help us in our day-to-day -day lives, in the relationships that we already have and in the relationships that we're going to even form and bond in the days to come. Uh, so, Lord, we, we need to be careful about what we ask for because you may allow it to happen. And, Lord, we need to be diligent to seek counsel and guidance from your word or from other godly people. Uh, so help us, Lord, to, to live according to your, your um, statements, your commandment even, um, commandment number nine, about we shall not bear false witness. And I think the, another scripture is coming to mind in Leviticus um, 19.11. You shall not steal nor deal falsely nor lie to one another. Um, that's just a, another scripture that we learned in Crown, and it was just another one that just continues to tell us to, it's just never in your best interest to tell a lie. If you can just get in the habit of always telling the truth, then you just never have to worry about covering up the, the last five lies that you told, and it's just a nightmare. So Lord, help us to be diligent, to be faithful and true to your word the best we can. Uh, and, Lord, we just uh, lean on you to help us do this. And, Lord, again, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray.